Uh, so my talk today will be based on work which I've done with Henri Sterdignac at OFSE and I have entitled the presentation Brexit Taking Back Control with a question mark, which is I think the most important thing in the title. And um, so the, the outline of my presentation will be on four main points, uh, what the UK uh, means by Brexit means Brexit, uh, the point of view of the European 27 countries, uh, what for future partnership can we uh, assume uh, will be uh, agreed between the UK and uh, the European Union? And last, but not least, the macroeconomic impacts of Brexit. And so, as you know, on, the, um, on June uh, 2016, uh, there was a referendum in the UK, and this referendum uh, led to uh, the British voting in majority uh, for the UK to leave the European Union. And uh, since then, uh, this has created a lot of uncertainty, first of all, of course, in the UK, uh, especially because those who were in favour of leaving the UK, the Leave campaign, were very surprised themselves by their victory, and it very soon appeared that they didn't have a clear strategy on how to uh, manage their victory after Brexit. But it was also um, a rise in uncertainty elsewhere in the European Union uh, because it became uh, possible then to think that one country could leave the European Union and also for regions where there is a lot of people who think that they should become independent, namely Scotland, uh, it's also a possibility to say, well, if the UK leaves the European Union, uh, we are going to ask for independence and we are going to apply for EU membership. And this could be followed by other regions in the European un Union. Uh, everyone would think currently of Catalonia, for instance. And so there is this uncertainty which has risen in the European Union and also there is a fragility which is there in the European Union, especially since the crisis where we have had this uh, uh, strategy of fiscal discipline and structural reforms and more and more people, more and more citizens are reluctant to move towards a more federal European Union. Uh, the British decision to leave the European Union was notified officially to uh, the uh, European Union um, on March 2017 when uh, Theresa May triggered the Article 50 of the Treaty on European Union and this now opens a window for the UK to leave the European Union within two years. So in March 2019 the UK will have left the European Union and though there is a very short time period to agree on the withdrawal agreement uh, between the UK and the other uh, European countries. Uh, there have been a number of negotiations started since March uh, last year. Uh, they, they reach, there was an agreement reached at the end of the year uh, between uh, the UK and uh, the other members of the European Union at the European C Council in December. And this agreement is still very ambiguous because well, the negotiation addressed many challenges. It is the first time that a country asks to leave the European Union until now we had had more and more uh, countries wishing to join the Union and there are many questions to address and on both sides uh, there is a wish to make uh, of this situation of Brexit a success. So for the UK uh, there is the hope to build a very deep and special partnership uh, between the UK and the other European countries, a bespoke agreement that would allow trade and go in goods and services to continue without frictions uh, between the, the UK and the, the other European unions once the UK has left. And with this, basically, a trade agreement, uh, the UK, UK will reco would, would recover its sovereignty, uh, especially uh, in terms of um, having the possibility to control immigration uh, from uh, European countries and uh, also of ending the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in the UK. On the other side, uh, for the uh, European uh, 27 countries, uh, there is really the wish to show that there is a substantial price to pay for a country to leave the European Union and that this country cannot expect to gain budgetary gain cannot explain to take advantages of 
leaving the European Union while keeping advantages of um, keeping ac access to the single market. So um, it is very important for the European 27 countries to avoid that other countries would be tempted to follow uh, the British uh, example. Um, in the UK, what does it mean, Brexit? Well, as you know, the UK joined the, the European Economic Community in 1973. But among European countries, the UK has always been very reluctant to move towards further European integration and always had a very fully consistent position. Uh, the British are happy to be in a liberal single market, but they don't, do not want to lose national sovereignty. They do not want to move towards social Europe. They do not want to move towards a political union and they, would not want, they don't, do not want to move towards a federal European Union. So already uh, two years ago, in February uh, 2016, the then uh, Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, had negotiated a tra an agreement with the European countries for a new UK settlement in a reformed European Union. And so this agreement was granting guarantees to the UK in terms of sovereignty. It was also uh, making a further push towards increased competitiveness within the European Union and it was giving the possibility uh, to the UK to restrict uh, immigration from workers from the European Union at least for a limited time period for seven years. And so this agreement uh, was intended to convince the British people to vote uh, in favour of remaining in the European Union but it was not uh, sufficient uh, to convince a majority of uh, voters to remain in the European Union. And among the reasons why the uh, British um, voted, at least a majority of them, to leave, um, they, are, they are very um, ambiguous. Because you can see that among the Conservatives and among the Labour Party, there are both people who wanted to leave and other who wanted to remain, but for very uh, different reasons. On the Conservative side, of course, the idea uh, to remain in the European Union is to remain in a liberal European Union and to keep access to a big uh, market. Uh, among uh, the Labour, the reason for remaining in the European Union, on the contrary, is to move toward a stronger social Europe, uh, which would guarantee uh, social rights workers in Britain. So you see two different arguments for uh, remaining in the European Union uh, on the UK si side. On the Leave side, there were also uh, very mixed considerations. Uh, for some, at least for most Brexiters, of course, the issue of domestic sovereignty is of uh, very high importance. Uh, the issue of rejecting immigration is another point. The issue, the issue of refusing solidarity with poorer European countries is another point. And also, uh, there are liberal considerations among um, Brexiters to say, well, Brussels, this is social uh, bureaucracy, this is technocracy, and we want to get rid of that. And so there is the idea for the harder Brexiter th that the UK would be better off outside the European Union and would, could be even more liberal than it is um, currently. Uh, and so there is this uh, big element for people who want voted uh, for Brexit, but there is also the issue of, um, of, uh, of um, there is also the issue of sovereignty. And when you have a look at uh, a map, uh, I don't know whether it's visible for everyone in the room, but when you have a look in the map, uh, in blue, these are the areas in the UK where people voted most in favour of remaining in the European Union. So they are basically uh, in Scotland, uh, in Northern Ireland, and a bit in uh, some parts of Wales. But in England and in the majority of Wales, uh, people voted in majority to leave the European Union, so this is the red part of the map, uh, except uh, in London. So there, is, uh, there are big differences um, across the UK in terms of, of votes, and also not only in terms of geography, but also in terms of uh, age. Younger people voted in general more to remain in the European Union, older people more to vote, voted uh, to leave the European Union, and also uh, blue workers voted more uh, to leave the European Union than higher skilled people. So really, uh, a British society which is really divided 
and steel is very uh, divided today. And uh, still today, uh, there is the, the idea among some remainers, so those who want to live, uh, to, to remain, sorry, in the European Union, and amo among them Tony Blair and Michael um, Eiseltein, that there should be, uh, there could be um, a new uh, referendum, and that finally, as the difficulties are so high for the UK to leave the European Union, finally the UK will not leave. Um, some remainers think uh, probably it should we the UK should go to what is called a soft Brexit. That is to say, a Brexit that would allow the UK to remain in the single market and in the customs unions. But this uh, possibility seems very um, unlikely from my point of view, at least, because the conditions which are requested by the European 27 countries so far, that is, if you want to remain in the single market, uh, you need to fulfill the so-called four freedoms of the European Union, that is free movements of goods, of services, of capital and labor, then that's not possible for the UK because the point on immigration is really one of the reasons why the UK voted uh, to leave, at least in the majority, to vote, voted to leave the European Union. And also the other point is the issue of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, which really a number of people uh, in the UK, starting with Theresa May, the, the, the Prime Minister, want to get rid of. So this issue of a soft Brexit is not easy at all and doesn't seem to be um, uh, very likely to, to, to happen. And for those who are really in favor, sorry, in favor of a hard Brexit, uh, that is of leaving the European Union without any deal, well, they see several advantages. One of them would be the fact that once the UK is out of the European Uni Union, it will not have to pay any more to the European budget. Currently, um, the UK is a net contributor to the UK budget to about that re amounts to around 0.5% of uh, UK uh, GDP. And so that there is the idea for the Brexiters, which was really strong in the referendum campaign, that the, the UK could use better the funds which are currently given to the EU budget and uh, instead reallocate re them to the uh, national health system. Uh, that was one of the strong points of the hard Brexiters. Uh, there is also the idea among the hard Brexiters that once the UK is out of the Union, it will be able to negotiate trade deals with countries outside the European Union, and especially with the US. And so these hard Brexiters are again a transition period. A transition period would allow to postpone the day when the, the UK leaves the European Union, this is what is probably going to, to happen. But the, for hard Brexiters, it is really uh, not the best solution and the UK should leave uh, as, as soon as possible. Of course, why the transition period? It's because, as I mentioned earlier, the UK only has two years to leave once it has triggered the, the um, Article 50, and two years is a very short period of time uh, to negotiate a withdrawal agreement. And meanwhile, uh, this is really uncertainty, especially for companies who don't know uh, exactly what trade deal is going, or what trade agreement is going to be done between the UK and the rest of the European Union, and whether companies should now stop investing in the UK and locate or relocate uh, production in continental Europe. So these are really big questions, and companies start say, well, we need to know in what uh, economic environment we are going to work in the future and so that's why this issue of a transition period has gained strength and um, now it has been agreed in December that the UK will have a transition period of until um, the end of 2020 before leaving. So this gives some, um, some space for uh, some time to, um, to reach an agreement which would be uh, hopefully uh, good for the UK. Uh, if I'm taking the position of the UK um, companies. Of course, for hard Brexiters, on the contrary, the UK should leave as soon as possible, and then once it is out of the European Union, it could possibly use tax competition, it could further cut um, corporate taxation, it could become a tax and regulatory uh, haven, and so this would be anyway positive for the UK to leave uh, the European Union. 
But um, as you see, there are very uh, different positions uh, even uh, within the UK um, itself. And for the UK government, well, the position is intermediary between all these positions and it has evolved over time. Uh, initially, uh, uh, Theresa May was really strict on, well, Brexit means Brexit. We need to have a clear Brexit. This is what the British citizens voted in majority for. Uh, but in early 2017, when she gave a speech at the Lancaster House, she was very clear that uh, the UK couldn't remain in the single market because the European Union um, countries said, well, it's not possible as long as you don't want to fulfill the full the four freedoms, you have to, uh, you cannot remain in a single market. And so that's why Theresa May I try, tries, I think, in a very pragmatic way uh, to reach a bespoke agreement um, for Britain and uh, the other European countries, something different from uh, agreements existing currently, uh, namely the ones with Switzerland or with Norway, uh, which would involve for the UK first uh, the continuation of contributing to the European budget, and second, uh, to comply to uh, European regulation. So finally, this and also to accept uh, the free mobility of labour. So these existing agreements cannot be accepted by the government currently, the UK government, and there is a need to find a bespoke agreement. Um, among the points uh, why uh, the UK Brexiters say, well, we could leave the European Union and this would not be so much of a problem, which is a, 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 a strong and a very uh, controversial point. Well, you see that half, approximately half of British exports go to the rest of the European Union. So this is really the big market for the UK. But at the same time, there is a deficit in terms of trade in goods and services between the UK and the rest of the European Union. And, well, I'm afraid uh, you may not see this small chart from, uh, from uh, everywhere in the room, but this, um, this line, this blue line here, starting from 1999, um, is the bilateral trade and, good, um, and services deficit between the UK and the, the other European Union. And so you see that there is a big deficit of the UK, on goods and services, and in fact it's a deficit in terms of goods, because in services the UK it has a surplus with uh, other European uh, countries, and but since, especially since the early 2000s, uh, this deficit has risen a lot, while at the same time the surplus in goods and services of UK, uh, as compared to the US, which is the red line here, here has kept on increasing, so it was mostly in balance in uh, 1999, and now you see this, uh, at least in 2015, so just before the vote, uh, there was a, a big surplus with the US, and there was also an almost balanced uh, trade between uh, the UK and the Commonwealth countries, which are also, of course, a big market for the, for the UK, but only you see 4% of exports. Uh, for Asia, uh, excluding India, which account for 17% of export of UK exports, you see that there is a deficit, but not so huge. The deficit is really with the European Union. So there is, uh, in terms um, of, um, of trade, uh, an interest for the UK to have uh, agreements with countries outside the European Union. And I think this is also a strength in the negotiation today between the UK and the European Union, Union and of course, the European Union says, well, well, we are a bigger market, bigger market than the UK. That's true. But at the same time, the UK is a big market uh, for uh, the European Union. And if I move to um, another slide, which is there, uh, if you look uh, um, <laughs> at this uh, a chart, which shows the uh, bilateral trades, <coughs> uh, surpluses, and <coughs> deficits for France towards uh, the rest of the world. So in red, these are the surpluses of France towards other areas of the world. In, in green, sorry, in green. And in red, these are the deficits. So the biggest deficit of uh, the French economy is towards China. So this is this big, huge deficit of 22 billion uh, uh, euros. 
but the big surplus, so the green um, line, which is there, is the UK. So the UK is the first and the biggest bilateral surplus for France. And this is also a surplus for most Europe area countries and really a, a big market. So it is also important in terms of, um, at least in, in economic terms, for the Euro area countries and the UK to find a good agreement uh, uh, with the UK due to this side of the market. And um, so of course, uh, so we're moving back to this, there is this, uh, this reality, economic reality, with very strong links between the UK and the other European uh, countries. Uh, on the European 27 side, as I was mentioning earlier, there is the wish uh, to ensure uh, that the UK cannot leave the European uh, Union without losing out of it. And so the European 27 countries have uh, established a very, very strict negotiating gu guidelines and they have um, decided to do it in a very uh, phasing the negotiations. So for the European 27 countries, initially, so last spring, when the um, negotiating uh, guidelines were adopted by the European uh, Council, uh, there was a very strong point of saying, well, negotiations with the UK are going to bear only on three issues. The rights of citizens, especially of the European citizens in the UK once the UK has left the European Union. The financial settlement, that is the amount the UK needs to pay when it leaves uh, the European Union to settle the accounts and the Irish border. And on all these three points, the European Union adopted a very tough uh, position and didn't want to talk about the future relationship between the UK and the European uh, 27 countries. And the European 27 countries were very, uh, kept very um, unified. Uh, there was a negotiator in chief, uh, Michel Barnier, who is really the one who negotiates with the, um, the UK. There, is no there are no bilateral talks between the, the UK and other countries. And the UK is, of course, in a very uh, difficult position uh, in this uh, negotiation. And um, there were initially five uh, negotiating rounds which were planned between uh, the UK and um, the Brexit Task Force at the uh, European Commission, um, starting from June to October. But already from the beginning, Davis, David Davis, who is the um, secretary for um, exiting the European Union, accepted this phasing of the negotiation. So only the points on citizens, financial settlements, and the Irish border were part of the negotiations until, until October, while what is most important for the UK is the future uh, relationships. And so on citizens' rights, I think that basically now there is almost an agreement uh, between the UK and the European Union. A lot of time was spent on this issue. Uh, my personal opinion is that both the UK and the European Union want uh, citizens to keep uh, similar rights on, on both si sides of the channels. But um, negotiations were, uh, went into very, uh, very high detail. And what one of the main points, which is a point of disagreement within the UK and uh, the European Union on that uh, citizens' rights issue, is of course the fact that from the European Union there is the wish that the European Court of Justice remain uh, um, in charge of uh, saying, uh, of giving a voice in terms of citizens' rights in the UK, while for the UK this is not possible. But I think a compromise has been reached between the uh, UK and the uh, European Union finally, and there will be, um, at least for some time, uh, the U European Con Court of Justice will be consulted at least for eight years by British courts uh, to ensure um, uh, the rights of citizens. On the second issue, um, which is uh, Northern Ireland and the Irish border, here also, and I no, no, not here also. I think on this point, really, uh, both parties want uh, to, to have 
peace remaining in place in Ireland. And this is a very difficult issue because if the UK leaves the single market, then there is a need to re-establish borders between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. On the, the side of the Republic of Ireland, uh, there is the wish not to have any border where the Irish uh, Republic exports a lot uh, to the UK. And so if there are border controls and uh, trade barriers, this would be a problem for the from the, um, the Irish Republic. On the Northern Ireland side, there is also the wish not to have any frontier, but there is also the wish to remain in, in the UK. And this is especially uh, a strong argument for one of the political parties in Northern Ireland, which is uh, the, the Democratic Union Party, which is a very uh, a small party, very conservative in terms of social social tile areas, but with a very, uh, um, who is not in favor of austerity and who is now part of uh, the government agreement of the UK since uh, Theresa May um, had to um, call, snap, uh, call sorry, snap elections last May, last June, sorry, last June. And uh, since then she lost a majority in the parliament and she had to find a, a party to, to have some small majority and this uh, Democratic Unionist Party is one of, is the party uh, who is uh, uh, in government with the, um, with the Conservative in the UK, so he has a strong uh, voice, I would say. And uh, so there is a very more, it's more a question of um, this issue of Northern Ireland finding a way not to uh, reintroduce uh, borders, while, uh, while uh, um, respecting the wish of the European Union not to, to have the UK in the single market. So as uh, the UK say, it requires a lot of uh, creativity to find a solution uh, to have border without border. So perhaps with some kind of electronic uh, controls at the border for vehicles. But this is still um, not a solved issue, but an issue on where each party agrees uh, there should be an agreement. On the financial settlement, um, here also positions have become closer between the UK and uh, the European 27 since la last April. And uh, th there is a clear agreement from the UK side on saying that they are going to fulfill their budgetary uh, commitments until 2020. Uh, they are going probably to uh, continue to contribute to investment afterwards. They are going, uh, they have promised to, uh, to pay their share in uh, European civil servants pensions expenditure. Uh, so that would amount approximately to 50 billion euros. Um, that's the point agreed uh, so far. And uh, so, uh, more or less, uh, at uh, December, in Dece last December, the European Council said, well, mm, there has been sufficient progress in terms of negotiations between um, the UK and uh, the EU 27 countries. And now there is a possibility, as the UK requested, to, um, to discuss on the future par partnership and to ensure that in March 2019, the UK doesn't leave the European Union without any deal, there is the agreement of a transition period between the UK and, um, and the other European countries until uh, December 2020. So this year there will be a lot of negotiations about the future um, trade agreements uh, uh, or partnership between the UK and, um, and the, the European Union. So. Uh, I think that there is a, uh, a big, uh, there is a risk that the European 27 uh, try to punish, so to speak, the UK for leaving uh, the European Union. Union. As I was saying earlier, there have been so far very tough uh, negotiations between the UK and the European Union. But from an economic point of view, I don't think this should be the be this would be the best solution because in terms in view of the trade links between the UK and the rest of the European Union, there is really wh what should be done is to find a balanced agreement 
which would allow the UK to continue to trade uh, with the rest of the European Union with, I would say, as less as possible frictions that, from the economic point of view, would be uh, the best uh, solution. Um, but uh, this is not perhaps what the, the European 27 countries are going to decide as a whole. It's, it's still too early to say. Because on the one hand, apart, um, apart from the political issues uh, for Europe, in terms of economic issues, I was saying earlier that there is a big surplus in terms of trade in goods and services for the European Union vis-a-vis -vis the UK. But there is a big issue which is the issue of the financial and banking activities and especially the role of the city. As you know, the city is a very, it's the first uh, strength of the UK economy. Currently, it's around 7% of UK GDP. And there is a wish from a number of countries in the euro area, among them uh, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, to attract a number of activities which are currently done in the city, to attract it in uh, their um, capitals. And there is a sort of competition now which is there in the euro area to say to the to bankers in London, well, come, come in our um, city, you will have lower taxes, you will have uh, lower taxes on your activities, you will have lower taxes on, uh, tr on the, the wages, trade, trade, um, traders wages so there is this kind of uh, competition and there is this big issue of financial uh, passporting rights uh, uh, which the UK may lose once the UK leaves the European Union and this is really a, a big battle which is there and which is not uh, settled um, so far. Um, so uh, what are the macroeconomic impacts of Brexit so far? Uh, before the June 2017 referendum, there had been a number of uh, documents which had been public by the British government, first of all, and uh, second by the international institution, by the OECD, the IMF, and these analyses were all saying that if uh, the UK was um, voting to leave the European Union, the day after, this would be a negative, important shock for the UK economy. That companies would cut uh, their investment because of the uncertainty of uh, future uh, trade and financial um, relationships between the UK and the European Union. That was for the short-term impact and for the longer-term impact, while GDP was expected to be lower due to Brexit, uh, because once the UK would have left the European Union, then the economy would become less efficient, uh, there would be trade barriers, there would be loss of our productivity because there would be less competition between uh, the UK and the rest, um, the rest of the European Union. And so when you take at least the uh, central scenario of the um, UK uh, Treasury, it was expected that the uh, uh, UK would be uh, would lose um, six percent of GDP uh, due to Brexit. This w between you may several scenarios were done, and at least the UK would leave close to four percent of GDP if it was going to move towards an agreement such as Norway currently have, or would lose even more than six percent of GDP up to seven point five percent of GDP if it was going to fall into the world trade uh, agreements only. So there was this big campaign from the um, UK Treasury, UK government and international institution to uh, to say, well, this Brexit is going to have a negative impact. The OECD also um, came with a number of um, um, estimates of uh, the loss in terms of GDP that the uh, uh, Brexit would, would bring about. And so for the OECD, uh, the amount of 2.5% of loss in GDP uh, was, uh, was mentioned. And uh, so, as you could see, finally, this main argument in terms of which was really saying to the uh, British voters, if you decide to leave, this is going to have a negative impact. 
in principle, you would have expected the British to say, well, okay, we are not going to leave the European Union. Well, our main interest for us is to be in the European Union for economic reasons, and so we are going to vote to remain. But finally, uh, this um, was not the, the choice of a majority uh, of voters. And what happened uh, after this, uh, this, this vote, um, uh, uh, this referendum. Here on this chart, uh, there are the exchange rates. In, in green is the exchange rate of the pound towards the, the dollar. So you can see that, yes, uh, uh, just after the referendum, there was a big fall of the exchange rate of the pound, which lost around uh, a bit more than 10%. And that, uh, after all, more or less stabilized at um, the same um, level until recently. Also, there was a big fall uh, of the pound towards the euro, which is um, the, the, the blue line. And now, even today, uh, the pound is roughly 10% below uh, the level uh, it had before the referendum. So there was a big fall in the exchange rate, which is now partly offset for the in terms of, of the dollar. But this fall, in my opinion, is not so much a problem for the UK economy because when you see the ex e um, effective exchange rates of, uh, of uh, the UK, well, in fact, the real effective exchange rate, let's say here, the green line, was uh, high just before the referendum. Uh, the green line is the exchange rate of the pound towards the dollar and the blue one of the exchange rate of the pound towards the euros. And so you can see that in terms of exchange rate, it was rather high. And in fact, the, European, uh, the UK economy, uh, especially towards the euro, as I showed you uh, earlier in the chart, uh, was having a strong deficit. And this was partly due to the uh, high level of the pound. And uh, in a sense, the, the vote of the referendum brought uh, the pound back to a more susten sustainable level for the for the British economy. So the loss of ex uh, the, the fall in exchange rate one of the, was one of the first short-term effect of Brexit. Uh, another effect uh, which was expected by, um, by um, the British government and international institution before the vote was that the fact that uh, the stock exchange would fall, that equity prices would collapse, uh, collapse after a Brexit vote. And uh, when you see this chart, so this is the chart of the uh, FTS uh, index. And it's very difficult to see where Brexit took place. Huh? In fact, there was really only a very small effect of, uh, of uh, Brexit, which was there. But since then, the exchange rate has regained 25%. And now it's, you, you can't see on the chart where this uh, Brexit vote uh, took place. No, so no major effect on, um, on stock markets. And another effect which was also uh, uh, mentioned by, um, as a risk by uh, the government before the UK government, before the, the vote, was the fact that if people voted to leave for Brexit, then there would be a loss of confidence from uh, investors in the UK economy. And there would be a rise in interest rates, a rise in government, government, government bond interest rates. And so this, is, um, uh, this level of 10 years government bond interest rate is in blue in this chart. Uh, the red one is the bond rates of Germany, which, as you know, is the lowest in the euro area and uh, which is used as a benchmark. And when you... Uh, just show the difference between the spread between the UK and German bonds. Well, you see that before the referendum, there was a government bond of around 1.5% in the UK, close to 0.4% in, in Germany, and a spread of 1.2% uh, or so. Here, you have the, the, the impact of the, um, of the Brexit vote on the UK government bond rate. But you see also that afterwards, nothing happened. Huh? You even had uh, a fall in the interest rates. And still today, the spread, so the difference between the UK and the German bond is very low, at less than 1%. So, so far, 
no one seems to be afraid uh, or to have lost confidence on, on the UK um, economy. And uh, the only, uh, apart from the exchange rate, the only main effect which has followed, which is, which is the contract sequence of the exchange rate, of the fall of the exchange rate, is the acceleration of inflation, uh, which is uh, in blue in this uh, chart. Uh, so before the vote, there was an inflation of around zero in the UK, and now it has reached around 3%. Uh, so the blue line, and um, and uh, you see that this is the effect of this 10% of fall in the exchange rate since the vote, which has led to an acceleration of inflation, which seems to have stabilized over now two or three months. So we have uh, an we have seen an acceleration of uh, inflation uh, in the UK, which of course reduces the purchasing power of consumers and has weighed on demand in the UK. But so far, the UK economy is still growing rather sus satisfactorily. We have a um, GDP growth of the UK economy, which is at 1.5% uh, on a yearly basis, which is not very different from what we have in France, for instance. Uh, there is slight deceleration of GDP growth in the UK from 1.8 before the vote to 1.5 now, so it's really small so far, while there has been some acceleration of, of growth in the euro area. So there is some effect of the Brexit, but it's very limited so far, and especially in terms of investment, we haven't seen any fall in uh, company investment. It has remained almost stable, but of course, Brexit has not already occurred. So everyone is still waiting to see what is going to be uh, the, agree the agreement between the UK and the other European un Union countries to decide, especially on the company side, of, of their investment. And, uh, and so um, this will be the, my, my last slide. <laughs> Uh, so, so far, we have not seen um, any um, macroeconomic impact apart from the exchange rate and inflation. But as I was saying, inflation is the first impact of the fall of the exchange rate. We may also expect now the, the fall of the exchange rate to improve the competitiveness of UK exporters. And we can already see at least in recent months, some acceleration of exports from the UK to the rest of the European Union. So there should be now some positive effects from the past depreciation of the pound in terms of gaining competitiveness for British exporters and so higher exports for the British economy. Uh, there is this uh, agreement between the UK and the other European countries on uh, transitional period. Now, in the, in the coming months, the main point will be whether uh, the two parties find an agreement which says, well, basically, uh, the UK will continue to be able to trade uh, with the rest of your, the European Union without a lot of constraints. And in that case, I do not see any major economic impact of Brexit in, um, in, uh, in the coming months. But if the European Union very keeps a very strong uh, position, uh, of course, this could uh, uh, have a very uh, strong impact on, on, on the UK economy. And so far, uh, Theresa May has remain, I, I succeeded uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make proposals, I think, in a very pragmatic way and to obtain at least from the Commission this uh, and the Council this transitional period. And so far, very small impact on the UK economy, but uh, a very big question mark on whether this is going to remain the case, depending on the agreement which will which be done between the, the two parties. Thank you. We can introduce ourselves. Uh, we would like to continue the seminar on the topic of Brexit. Uh, I'm Victoria Kapziste from Option A, um, Economics of Knowledge and Innovation, and here's my colleague um, Adgad Zulkifli uh, from Macroeconomics Option. Uh, first, could you please change the slides?
First of all, we'd like to demonstrate the timeline of the perception of people towards the European Union. How did the opinion towards the European Union change over time? So in 1996, you may see that uh, the number of people who um, wanted to stay in the European Union but reduce its power significantly de increased. What was the reason? First of all, uh, European Union banned the export of uh, beef of the United Kingdom and people of course didn't like this decision. And then in 1999 uh, we may see another increase. That's the time when um, uh, common currency was introduced and the United Kingdom decided to not to take this decision. Um, then we may say that 2004 was a very important year since um, 10 countries from Central and European, um, Eastern European uh, um, countries were introduced to the European Union. And in 2013, David Cameron promised um, its, uh, his people to um, make a push in um, the organizing the referendum. And as all we know, in 2016, a referendum took place. Uh, what were the main reasons behind the referendum? Um, as Madame Mathieu already mentioned, economical reason and monetary policy regulation, as well as immigration. Uh, also, some people um, said in the surveys that uh, very crucial for them is independence and sovereignty. Um, I would like to um, stop on the division of Brexit vote. Um, uh, since it was very important to differentiate the vote from the point of view of geography. For example, if we see uh, the share of votes in London, we may know that Londoners in general support the European Union, as well as Northern Ireland and Scotland. 62% um, of, of Scottish people prefer to remain in the European Union. Um, as uh, we know, in 2014, Scotland had a referendum and 55% of um, voters said they would like to stay in the UK. Why? They had a fear that Scotland would need to reapply for the membership in the European Union. So um, nowadays in the public discourse, we can see that um, people actually talking about the new referendum for Scotland. Will it happen or not? We don't know. Another uh, part of the United Kingdom is Northern Ireland. As Catherine already mentioned, that um, it's crucial to uh, solve the problem of border since uh, it affects more than 30,000 people uh, who are uh, crossing the border every day. Also, um, we would like to add that Republic of Ireland has the uh, final say in the negotiation and it's heavily supported by the European Union. Um, we don't know yet if the hard border will be installed or it will be digital border. Um, it still needs to be decided. Uh, the immigration, um, another part of the discourse, so um, in 2005 immigration accounts for 50% of the UK GDP and uh, most of UK immigrants are actually coming from non-European Union countries. But as you can see on this graph, the share is not that different. So. Um, when the uh, removal of restriction for Bulgarian and Romanian workers were introduced, this number started to come together. Um, generally, the uh, immigrants who come to European Union uh, and to United Kingdom specifically are educated and uh, young. So 40% of European Union immigrants finish tertiary education and the employment rate for European Union immigrants in the United Kingdom is higher than for any other group and for the UK nationals um, in general. Another interesting thing is that uh, jobs which are taken by these immigrants are usually from the low wage sectors. These are the jobs which are left behind by the nationals and British people just don't want to work at these jobs. Um, after the Brexit, after the referendum, the net European Union immigration uh, to the United Kingdom fell to the lowest level recorded in 2017. Um, it is now prognosed that 30, um, they are expecting 30% decrease in the immigration to the European Union, uh, from the European Union to the UK. It is still less that is targeted by the Prime Minister Theresa May, uh, but it's already a good result as uh, being considered by the Euro UK Parliament. Uh, European Union after Brexit. What is uh, the opinion of European Union on it? First of all, um, 
Europe would um, ensure that the rest of European countries will remain in the European Union. How to do it? They will set the highest price they can. Um, as you can see here in this graph, the main countries which think that um, European Union is not that good for them anymore are Greece, France, United Kingdom, Spain, Germany and Netherlands. Uh, so to ensure that these countries will stay in the European Union, they will say the highest price they can. Also, um, some experts think that UK, um, that uh, you European Union can get stronger after the UK leaves. Why? Um, because uh, nowadays um, there is no common integration and foreign policy in the European Union and after the UK leave uh, there will be common currency and tax policy um, agreed on. So, and uh, it is expected that European countries will cooperate more uh, after the Brexit. And here you may see the general prognosis on the GDP. Uh, we have um, central value, we have optimistic prognosis and pessimistic one. So if we start from the optimistic, uh, the GDP will decrease by 3.8%. Central prognosis is minus 6.2. And the World Trade Organization, the one who gives the most negative uh, value for the GDP um, growth in um, the UK, it is 7.5% decrease. So now I'm giving the floor to my colleague. He will give the closer look to the macroeconomic implications of the Brexit. Thank you very much, Victoria. So I would like to continue with my favorite stylized fact on how catastrophic Brexit might be for the UK economy. I hope it would be clearer than this, but I guess we stuck with this. So this is the snapshot of the southeastern part of England. Here we have Dover. Dover is the busiest port in the world. Fifth, more than 50% of all UK exports and, and imports to European Union is processed to Dover. As of now, for a truck going out of a uh, UK to European Union, it will take only less than two minutes on average for it to be processed because basically there is no processing. They just have to go through. There is no immigration control, checking uh, whatsoever. But there is this research from the British Transport Agency that shows that if you add only two minutes per average to each truck going to European Union for the processing time, the congestion will go all the way here to Ashford. Now mind you, this is already 25 kilometers long. However, if you add another four minutes, the congestion will go all the way to Maidstone. If we add another two minutes, it will reach the entrance of Toll Road M25, which is basically on the doorstep of London, the capital itself. Now you might argue that, Aga, come on, you are just keep adding minutes here just to make your point. Well, granted, I added eight minutes here, but mind you, for trucks going out to non-EU destination like Turkey, like Switzerland, like Ukraine, the average processing time is 45 minutes. So even with eight minutes that I add here, it's still very, very, very optimistic. If we add 45 minutes, the truck may be in Atlantic Ocean. So it's still very optimistic. And it shows that how, actually, even, we are, even if we are talking about less economic stuff and more about the reality of the situation on the ground, there is very few preparation that has been done on how we can process, process with this. Because of course, if we, if we want the trucks to be treated more, Firstly, there has to be some special arrangement with the European Union, but that would mean that the European Union would prefer, would treat UK export more preferably, which means not a WTO arrangement, but some special arrangement. But we don't think that that is very possible with the line that is being taken by the European Union. For this slide, we are talking about the risk premia, but most of the data has already been mentioned by Madam Matthew, so we wouldn't want to dwell too much into the petition here. But some of the highlights that we want to also repeat is that inflation has been very high lately. It reached five years high. And as has been also mentioned, the effect on currency and uh, this one is the effect on the 10-year bonds. It has been quite dramatic, like this one as well. But after the, after the initial after the initial impact, it has been more or less stabilized on some level. But of course, Brexit is still very far from happening, so it can change pretty quickly. But also, we would like to also repeat that it is peculiar that the stock market doesn't seem to care. So yeah, it lost almost 2 trillion euro in the day after Brexit. But after that, they just don't seem to care anymore. This is the stock market. And we, like by the matter you pointed out, it will be very challenging for us to point at which point Brexit actually happened if we don't have the context. Another peculiar point is confidence level because here we have the business confidence index. 
we would expect that with Brexit happening, the business would be becoming less optimistic, but it doesn't seem to be so. Uh, the, the business confidence index has been going strongly since Brexit, June 2016 to last month, December 2017. And the consumer confidence index, it might look like it's fluctuating a bit, but the range is really fairly negligible, so it remains more or less on the same level. But uh, on the other hand, we also noticed that the consumer credit keeps growing by 10.8% last year. And this is interesting because real household income only increased by 2%. So we didn't expect this. Many economists expect that after Brexit happened, the household will become more prudent. They would save more, they would consume less, but this has not happened. For some reason, the household, instead of doing that, they consume. Not only consume, they borrow to consume. So it's a little bit peculiar. And it's also one of the reasons why the Brexit economy has been holding up quite well, which is uh, another point. And also regarding trade, so the, the European Union engagement with UK has been very beneficial on UK trade. Her Majesty Treasury research shows that the EU membership increased UK trade by three quarter. And then also uh, UK trade with countries with whom EU signs FDA, such as Chile, such as South Korea, has also been increasing. And 10.24% of UK's labor force are actually linked to exports. So it shows how important export is for the economy. However, as we can also see the balance of trade here right after Brexit on June 2016 until the latest development from the late part of 2017. Well, it fluctuates, but more or less it's still in the same range, which is negative three to negative five. However, the considerable improvement is, could be seen from the export, which is indeed increasing a little bit uh, on the period. And of course, this, is this was heavily helped by the currency depreciation that we have discussed previously. The future trajectories will, of course, depend on what kind of deals the UK can secure, not only with the European Union, but also from other major, trade econo major trading economies like China, which may is which Prime Minister May is currently pitching nowadays in Beijing, and also uh, with USA, of course. But even then, most optimistic scenario from UK's own Brexit department suggests that even in the most optimistic situation where there is a prefer, there is when, when UK get a preferable treatment with EU and also China and USA, there will still be a 2% decline in GDP after 15 years. And even worse, in case of a worst case scenario, hard Brexit, Trade credit insular Euler Herms forecasted that the export will decline by up to 67% in 2019. So the effect will be catastrophic. The last point will be on investment. Three quarter foreign investors mentioned that access to European market is their main reason to invest in UK. So when that access is gone, we can already predict what might happen to the investment, to the foreign direct investment in UK. Whereas uh, EU membership itself has increased UK FDI by around 14 to 38 percent, according to research by Dingla et al. Another survey by EY, an accounting firm, shows that EU, uh, UK's attractiveness as an investment decision has been hurt, has been hurt from Brexit. And once again, however, there is a peculiarity because actually in 2016, UK recorded the biggest FDI inflow it ever recorded, which we did not anticipate. But however, if we take a deeper look into the composition of this FDA inflow, we will see that around 90% of the value of this FDI comes only from two deals, which was the acquisition of Submiller, a brewery, and also the acquisition of Arm Holdings, a microprocessor producer. So it's kind, it can be fairly tricky to just see the FDI data from this way because it has been used by some Brexit tears as an argument that we are stronger after Brexit. We have the biggest FDI inflow ever, but 90% of it comes only, only from two deals. So it's a little bit hard to interpret that that way. And lastly, uh, another research by Dingra et al. shows that Brexit would reduce FDI in UK by 22% over the next decade. It also shows that the, inf the effect on income losses from lower FDI will be higher than that from lower trade. So it might hurt income as well. We would like to end by some questions from other Matthew. The first one is that uh, we, we are aware of the position that you expressed on the necessity of second referendum, but fairly recently there is a survey, survey by EICM that suggests that now more respondents that have an opinion actually won a second referendum, 58 versus 42 percent, and that the remain will now narrowly win, 54, 51 
versus 49%. So our question is that, is this compelling enough for a second referendum? Because on the other hand, we know, we know uh, well, Brexit means Brexit. We never know for sure Brexit means what. But lately, we have uh, quite a good idea of what Brexit does not mean. It does not mean that the UK can cherry pick between, the, between immigration, free immigration and free trade as a sample. Uh, it doesn't mean that the UK can just maintain the access to single market without the immigration. So on that front, we have a better idea that there has to be a threat off, and maybe it might be beneficial to, to also include that in a second referendum to know whether the citizen want to incur the cost of Brexit, which, which is not having the single market access only for the immigration as a sample. Also number two, we have seen a rather bizarre consumption behavior by UK household post-Brexit. And well, it, it has been helpful to the UK economy. And if it can be maintained, of course, it will be helpful for the UK economy, economy in the future as well, if the household sector will keep consuming. The question is that, uh, how would you interpret this rather bizarre behavior? And do you think it might last and sustainable? The last one is that, uh, what would Brexit mean for the EU's international standing and security? As even though uh, the fact is that uh, Britain still composes a quite substantial amount of military and diplomatic power that is within the EU, so losing UK will still leave a mark on the EU's ability to posture itself outwardly. So what would it mean and would it matter a lot for the European Union as a bargaining chip? And yes, that will be all for now and this is our reference. Thank you. We will now proceed with a session for you to give your comments and also answers. Maybe we would limit that to around 15 minutes to give, to give the other students more chance All right. later on. Thank you. Well, so well. thank you very much for the... Uh, introduction to the discussion and for your, your, your question. On the first point, uh, more respondents want a second referendum. Yes, this is true. Recently, this, uh, the mood has changed. The point is um, how you, just as you put it, Remain would now narrowly win. But if you have a look at the polls before the referendum, and at least for two years before the referendum, most of the times, polls were suggesting that Remain would win with this margin, 51 to 49%. This was oh, more or less uh, the case in, well, in the majority of polls. But what was interesting also at that time was that 20% of respondents did say that they didn't know how they would vote. And so now currently, there is such a narrow margin in terms of polls that if a referendum was organized, well, you don't know whether you would have the same result or not. And this is probably one of the reasons why so far, at least, the government doesn't want to do a second referendum because there is uh, a probability, a high probability that after all, it would still be 51 to 49 percent of people who would say they want to leave. There is this risk. So this wouldn't um, solve uh, the issue, but perhaps, I, w I have to say perhaps because, well, there are so many uncertainties around these uh, Brexit issues and starting with polls, when you had to look at polls before the referendum, everyone was saying first at polls, second at the economic impact which was announced by, uh, by the, the government and the international institutions where everyone was saying, well, in principle, all those people who do not know whether they are going to vote to remain or to leave, in view of the uncertainty, finally, they are going to say, well, we remain because, well, we know for sure in what situation we are and there are uh, advantages of being in the Union, there are advantages of living, but we don't know exactly what would happen when we leave. This is uh, this uh, this, fam this famous uh, leap into the unknown, and so you would just um, decide to remain. But I think that even today there will still be um, a big risk uh, in terms of well, doing a referendum. You don't know whether the, the, um, the results would be different, and maybe a possibility could be maybe, 
that once there is a deal agreed between the government and uh, the um, European Union, the UK government and the European Union, a referendum is done basically on this project. Because currently, if you have a referendum, you do not know any, a w which kind of agreement you may reach with the European Union. So this might not be the right time to, to do a new referendum. But once uh, Theresa May had agree, has agreed a deal with the European Union, then perhaps the possibility could be to say uh, with a, uh, to the British people, well, this is the agreement um, reached by the government. Please vote, remain or leave. That, that could be uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps an option, but uh, uh, so far I'm not so sure that the British would vote uh, uh, to remain uh, currently. Uh, on the second point, which you raised on the rather bizarre consumption uh, behavior, well, I'm not so sure it's so bizarre, because what happens? You have this Brexit vote, but you have no macroeconomic impact in the short term. So companies continue to hire people. Uh, the unemployment continues to fall, continues to fall. People have their wages. The inflation is starting to rise, but rather uh, smoothly. So you start from zero to three percent now. So consumption, in fact, more or less followed uh, the purchasing power of households. So there was nothing special in terms of no nothing bizarre in terms of consumptions. Uh, just some deceleration of, inf of uh, um, consumption due to the acceleration of uh, inflation. But at the same time, also, there are very low interest rates in the UK. And as you mentioned in your, um, in your discussion, the ha households keep, uh, keep on borrowing while they can borrow at very low interest rates. That is also true for other countries, by the way. But in the UK, this remains to be the case. At the same time, you have stock, stock exchanges which goes up and up, so you have dividends, which you see in the household's uh, um, incomes, uh, and you have also a rise in housing prices, which continue, so which, uh, which is also part of the reason why uh, households borrow. But, well, so far the British citizens see, consu consumers see that they have rather, uh, still have incomes still rising, they have dividends rising, they have housing prices rising, so there is nothing is bizarre in consumption until, until now, until now. And uh, whether it might last, uh, I think I would say yes, it might, because if we consider that now uh, the pound has reached a level which is 10 or 30 percent, 13, sorry, percent below uh, its pre uh, Brexit vote level, you are not going to see any further rise in um, inflation if there is no other shock uh, coming. And so you may have steel consumption rising at 1.5 percent per year for some time. The point is uh, to me whether at when or whether companies are going to stop investing or even to reduce their investment. And then if you see this happening, you will see um, less job creation and possibly cuts in job creation. And then you will see lower incomes for households. And then you will see a change in consumptions. This will be less investment, less uh, output, less uh, uh, wages, and less consumption. But this would be a second step. Yeah. Once, once companies make a decision, if they make a decision to stop investing in the UK. And, um, and that would be a big shock, of course. And uh, what would Brexit mean for the uh, EU's international standing and security? Uh, that this is a big issue because, well, so far uh, at the European Union level, mm, people talk about yes, citizens' rights, financial st settlement, and Irish borders. Well. Irish border is very important on the political front. The other two points, well, uh, financial settlement is really not a big issue in my view. It's really, okay, it's nice to have can't accounts uh, settled, but when you see as compared to economic issues and to the issue of um, uh, the, um, political uh, issues, it's, it's very small. And this there, of course, uh, the UK has a big weight. And you see, 
when you hear the, the, um, the speeches of uh, heads of state in uh, the European Union, say Emmanuel Macron, for instance, well, eh, well, there is this weight of the UK which is there in the international uh, level. And so it's not uh, that easy to say to the UK, well, we are really go going to punish you very hard hmm, because, well, the UK is very strong and it has a very important role in terms of security, in terms of fight against terrorism. And there is a reality which is there and there is a clear wish from uh, uh, Theresa May to say, well, we, are, we want to... To, to remain, um, in, we, re we remain in Europe. In fact, that's what she said. We are leaving the European Union, but we are not leaving Europe. So there is this clear uh, element uh, which which is there, and so this is also one of the reasons uh, why I think uh, well the, the European 27 countries should not go uh, too far in uh, or cannot go too far in punishing. Uh, uh, in punishing uh, the UK. So that would be my, my, um, my main um, answers to, to, to your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, now it's time for our audience to ask the questions, if uh, there are some. <laughs> okay, don't forget to uh. introduce yourself, not only your name, but also where you come from. Okay. Hello, my name is Thiago uh, from Brazil, option B. Uh, I would like to ask the impact of the Brexit on the fi financial uh, financial sector and uh, having London as one of the main uh, uh, places for the that the financial sector works, and I want to understand better the impact of the Brexit. Right. Uh, I would suggest to take some more questions and then uh, I'll come back to you. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm from Ireland. Um, and I'm from option B, which is the macroeconomic uh, track. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of building on Tiago's question in some sense. We saw that France has this massive surplus, um, well, a large surplus, vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the uh, UK. Um, and I was wondering then, given the fact that all these companies, especially the financial and professional services companies, will be probably leaving London, do you think overall that Paris stands to gain, France stands to gain, okay, it might not be able to export, as much um, to the UK, the, it will probably diminish in terms of the size of the surplus, but in terms of like companies setting up shop in France and perhaps elsewhere in the EU, um, will France overall be a net, uh, have a net gain or net loss, do you think? All right, let's take this too. Let's answer. All right, so, so on your, your first question on the, the financial um, sector, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, well, the weight in UK GDP of the financial sector is around 7% of GDP. So, and this is basically the city of London. So you can imagine that if there is really a Brexit where uh, uh, British companies uh, lose their passporting right, that is the possibility to continue to trade in services with the rest of your, the European Union, basically you could lose 7% of, uh, if you lost all <laughs> the activities, 7% of UK GDP. <coughs> well, this is w one point. Uh, you may also think that uh, there is such um, specificity of the city of London, uh, which other uh, cities do not have elsewhere in the European Union, that for at least for a number of years, the city of London will, would continue to keep a number of activities. And I would say that probably, even if there is uh, a strong position from the European Union, so that British companies lose their passporting rights uh, to export trades, in, to export services in the European mm. Union, the, probably there would be some kind of creativity among the financial sector. So, okay, and that's already what banks, a number of banks have been doing, that is having some, putting some headquarters in Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, in several cities in the Euro area to ensure that 
if there is no deal um, which would allow the city to continue to trade with the rest of uh, the, the European Union, at least there will be headquarters which will be there. And so you can imagine that with a very f uh, few people working there, and after all that the activities would be done finally in London. So I think there would be probably much less than 7% of GDP that would be lost uh, in practice. And you cannot exclude also, which is something which has been said initially by Philippe Amond, the Chancellor of the Czech World, if the European Union is too, str too strict with the UK, then the UK could be really pushing forward towards lower taxes and a number of deregulation in the city of London, which could also be very attractive for international investors. And so finally, there is really a big risk that the city of London uh, remains, uh, I mean, from the European uh, point of view, remains strong with a very, uh, very different uh, rules, much less regulation, very low taxation rates, really the tax haven is there. So I'm not so worried for the city of London. I think they will find any way a very good um, way to, to remain strong. That's what I would, um, I, I would say. And um, on, your, on your point on the uh, French economy, uh, I think this would be a loss for the French economy because, uh, well, um, as I showed, well, there is really a big surplus of uh, the French exports vis-à-vis uh, -vis the UK. And so there is really, from the company's point of view, except from the financial sector, which hopes that uh, every banker in London would be happy to come and live in Paris, which I think is a bit uh, optimistic. Uh, I think, except for the financial sector, for the rest of the activities, uh, it would be a loss if there are trade barriers or new regulation between the UK and the European Union. Of course, one can say because the European Union is so huge as compared to the UK, they could put uh, trade barriers and regulation. But on the other side of the channel, they could also say, well, and they have said this also, if, if there is uh, um, trade barriers and regulation, harder regulation on the European side, we also we can do the same. And then, of course, for French companies, they are going to lose one of their big markets. So you may say this is a short-term effect. And progressively, the French uh, exporters could uh, export more to uh, Germany, for instance. But when you see the trends in exports, in French exports for a number of years now, uh, there is a deficit, a trade deficit with Germany. And there is a trade surplus with the UK. It, this is there. So that means that in terms of goods and services which France is producing, the British uh, seems to have uh, more appetite to buy them than, than the Germans. So it would need a lot of time, I think, for the French uh, companies to, uh, to re refine another market as compared to the UK. And there are also a number of um, cooperation. Of course, one of them is Airbus. In, uh, which is really this big uh, project between Germany, uh, France, Spain, the UK. And this would be a loss also if there is no agreement uh, uh, between uh, the UK and the rest of the European Union. And also in a number of areas in energy, where also France has been quite successful in, um, in having companies working in the UK, in the electricity and so on. If, if there is a... Uh, uh, no good uh, agreement between the UK and the European Union, this will be also a loss, uh, a loss for France. And then uh, these are all, um, I would say, this brings back to, to your presentation, these are all assumptions which we can make at the moment. But when you said, well, the, 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 there are these um, scenarios of the, uh, the losses of uh, the UK economy once it leaves uh, uh, the European Union with these different scenarios of w WTO, AAA or central scenarios. Okay, but this is all based on assumptions. We, we really uh, do not have, first of all, any experience of having had a country leaving the European Union. We have models or there are models that sh you can use to say, well, if the UK leaves, what are going to be the impacts? 
But all these impacts are really assumptions because in terms of foreign direct investment, for instance, these models will say, well, there will be fewer foreign direct investment in the UK if they leave. That, that's a possibility. But you may also say that if the UK changes its regulatory uh, framework, there might be more foreign direct investment in the UK. So there are so many, so many possibilities and so many assumptions that uh, well, we, I think we have um, to be uh, very, uh, very cautious about uh, the different impacts. But for sure, the UK is currently in a very good situation in the European Union. And so if it leaves, that there is a cost, but we don't know the size of the cost. Uh, yes, we have more questions. Please introduce yourself and um, tell what option you are and uh, what country you come from. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm Julian, I'm from Argentina. Uh, my question is, given that um, May's government is far from being st strong and stable and, and a hypothetical Labour Party coalition government might be in the horizon, uh, what would be the scenario for Brexit in this case, given that I don't think that being a tax haven would be the Labour Party preferred choice? Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Victoria. I'm from Austria. Um, and originally I wanted to ask exactly about something you just answered with answering the last questions about all of these predictions. Um, and just a quick comment on that. Um, I think we, we, as you said, we really have to be careful with those predictions. <coughs> and I think it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of a lost time discussing these issues in terms of how many, how many points of GDP are going to be lost and how many are not going to be lost. Uh, because we don't know, and there is, there is absolutely no way of knowing. Um, and my, my question is, um, you've been talking a lot about uh, a loss for the EU and a loss for France. Uh, in, in economic terms, and you've put that very much in the forefront of your talk. But shouldn't we, in this case, really be talking more about the political issue at hand? I mean, the, yes, of course, it would be a loss for the EU, but it would, it would not be a big loss. If we were not, be, if we were not be able to export this, it, how much is it? It's 5% it's, uh, of intra-EU trade. It's not a lot that we would be losing. Um, and shouldn't the, the political issue be more important in this case, a political issue of keeping other countries from trying to exit the European Union? Uh, would you prefer to answer these two questions or we can take one more? Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, so, on the political situation in the UK, yes, of course, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's very complicated. It's very complicated. And uh, you may say, well, currently, well, the Theresa May is, has a government where there are so many positions, even within the government, about whether it should be good to, it's, it's a good solution to have Brexit, and if so, uh, which kind of Brexit? So there are so many divisions uh, among the government. And uh, you could see in the June, in last June election, that uh, the Labour Party, uh, came very strong in the in the elections, um, but uh, I think the main reason why the Labour Party was so strong in the election was not because of Brexit uh, issues, but because the Labour Party had very strong arguments against austerity, uh, which he, he was uh, which he could develop during the campaign. But when you see the positions within the Labour Party on Brexit, there is also such a division. It's really, even if you start with Corbyn, uh, he has always been very reluctant to move <laughs> towards further integration of the UK in the European Union, and even voted initially against, uh, in 1973, against uh, um, UK membership in the European Union. And um, there is the also this division among the Labour Party on say, well, should we, among the remainers, should we remain because we want to have more social Europe or because we, have to, we want to have a more liberal Europe? So let's imagine that there are elections now or soon and that the Labour Party wins. I don't know. I don't know how the Labour Party would be able to have a consistent position about 
remaining or leaving. It's, it's also, it would be a, as complicated as today, I think, for the conservatives. And um, maybe one could say also that for many uh, British people at the moment, it's not so bad that there is uh, Theresa May there trying to do what she can about Brexit because nobody knows really what, what, what could be done. So this is, but this is a, this is a big, um, a, 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 a big, uh, a big question. On the um, on the on the loss, uh, well, uh, I must say I, I'm a macroeconomist, so I have a bias to <laughs> to talk about first of all macroeconomic uh, issues. So that's why my talks was uh, really focused on this first of all, and also during the the campaign and still today in the debate, uh, this is always this issue of economic cost, and I agree with you that. Everyone, a British citizen may say, well, OK, you, you tell me that uh, we are going to lose 6% of GDP in the long term if we leave the European Union. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to have uh, this 6% uh, less because I'm going to have other, another economic organization, another way of organizing also um, sovereignty, political issues and so on. So this is, uh, this is why also I think it, there is a consistent uh, point of view uh, from the British also to vote against, uh, to, leave, to, re to, to leave the European Union. Because after all, you may say, we do not want to be part of a club such as uh, the Euro area. That's what the British have said clearly from the start. They do not want to be part, at least the majority of British people, they don't want to be part of a political union and they don't want to move to a federal union. And so from that perspective, you may say, that's perfectly clear. You know that there is an economic cost, at least in the short term. You don't know how much this cost will be, but there will be some cost. Uh, you are ready to pay, to pay for it. And so I think this would be perfectly consistent that the UK <laughs> lives in, in, in that uh, perspective. In the euro area, uh, there are also there are several um, uh, several points of view on, uh, on this issue of the UK leaving the, Euro er, uh, the, the European Union. Because you may say, as you suggest, well, after all, well, the UK, they leave, and this is a way for the Euro area to, to grow and to be stronger. This is a possibility. But at the same time, for a number of countries, or at least governments in the Euro area, it's very important to keep a very good um, partnership with the UK, because since the beginning, the UK has always been pushing uh, towards uh, liberal uh, reforms in Europe. And still in 2016, when David, David Cameron um, reached this agreement with the European Union, it was not only about the UK in the European Union, but also on saying the European Union should be more liberal. There should, we should move towards a more liberal union. And so from a number of people within the Euro area, it's also important to keep the UK not so far, because this is a way to push towards these reforms. So there are several dimensions in the Euro area, and not all people or not all countries in the Euro area want to go in the same direction. You were mentioning in your presentation also the issue of tax policies, for instance, but tax, policies, tax policy coordination in the Euro area. I perfectly agree. But do we want, as a Euro area, to go to more, towards more taxation, let's say, company taxation, or to go towards less taxation? So this is a, a big topic on which all countries, all governments, do not agree. So the issue of uh, what uh, the Euro area wants to do in terms of um, tax harmonization, social harmonization, economic regulation, well, this is really a topic for discussion within the Euro area. And uh, we should, I think, uh, keep this in mind also. OK, uh, do we have more questions? Um, as other? OK. OK. Uh, so I, I guess we can conclude on this point. Thank you very much for coming. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your presentation and sharing with us your point of view. Uh, we are very, very grateful for this. Hope to see you next time. Uh, thank you very much for coming here, the audience. Thank you.